Amen. All right, Jared, let's get into the message this morning. I'm preaching today, continuing the series called Amazing Grace. And today, I'm, I, last week, we talked about the purpose of the law. And I gave you four things that the law of God's given to us. We're not saved by the law, and we're not under the law. We're under grace. But when we got hooked up with Jesus, he wrote the law on our heart, we're told. And so there's still a purpose for God's law. Remember what, what they were? Talk to me. Let, me. let me give you a little quiz today. What's one of the purposes of the law? Come on. Oh, he's a master. The law is a master. All right, come on. A mirror. What else? A map, a road map. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you'll get in the book, it'll teach you how to walk with God. Amen? And teach you how to have a, a life of victory instead of a life of defeat. I met somebody out in the parking lot, and I said, how are you doing? They said, we're on top. I said, I'm more than a conqueror. How about you? <laughs> Amen. How do you know that? The book says this is how you do it. Amen? What else? I told you one other thing. The book is a what? A measure. The book is a measure, not to measure you, but to measure me. Not for you to measure me, but for me to measure me. The book is not a machete. It's not something we hack people up with. No, that's not it. It's a, I measure myself to see where I am in my walk with God. Well, this morning we're going to talk about another aspect that I think is terribly important. The Bible talks about works, and they are important. Good works are important. Two scriptures, 1 Corinthians 10, we'll look at, our, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 to 15, and Revelation chapter 20, 11 through 15. Probably I won't get to Revelation 20, 11 through 15 until next week. I'm just going to give you a little heads up. Uh, I, I, usually I have three points this morning. I have one, and we're going to focus on one. Now, there'll be a lot of other scriptures that we look at, but the main scripture, I want you just to find it, 1 Corinthians 3, and we'll look at there. We'll get there after a while. But uh, maybe put a marker there and find Ephesians chapter 2, because that's, that's where we're going to plug in. It's where we're going to start. Very familiar scripture, but something that's very important for us to get a hold of. Amazing works. Works are important. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Paul says, for by grace you have been saved. Now, don't miss that. I talked to you a few weeks ago about the past tense of salvation. When you get born again, you have been saved. It's past. You're justified. Do remember? I emphasize that we're saved. We're, it's past tense. We are sanctified. All of that happens when I get plugged into Jesus. Now, I grow, I walk in grace, and I learn, and I develop as a believer. But the DNA for everything God wants to give us happens at that moment when I say I trust Jesus as my Savior. And, and I, I've said it this way to you. When you get, it's when you give all that you know of yourself to all that you know about God. It's not just nodding your head, signing a card, shaking a hand, and saying, I'm going to walk with God. No, it's when you surrender your life to God, giving all that you know of yourself to everything that you know about Him. Now, if you are alive, you're going to develop. You're going to grow. So if you get born again, you can't stay like you are. You come in like you are, but you don't go away like you are. He changes your life, and your life begins to develop along the way. So it's by grace. Don't miss that. It's by grace that you've been saved. Now, let me say one other thing. Some folks that teach grace say that you have nothing to do with anything at all. It's all of God. Well, that's not what the Scripture says. The Bible says, for by grace you've been saved. Your part, then, is to exercise faith. It is a gift of God. It's given to you. But you have a part. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to repent of sin. And when you do that, God transforms your life and the Holy Spirit of God sweeps in, sweeps out what needs to be swept out and begins to fill you up 
with his presence as you walk with him. So it's by grace we have been saved through faith. That's our part. That not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So nail that down. Salvation is completely by God, but you have a part. Listen to me. Uh, let, let, let me get to my notes because I'm going to dig way off if I don't. Grace is the root and good works becomes the fruit of a life. We're saved by grace alone, but grace that is God's grace that has real faith is never alone. It's followed with works. So the root is God's grace the fruit becomes the work of your life. I think I'll make preach a series on that. The root. What's your roots? Are you rooted in the grace of God? How wonderful that is. So we're saved by grace. That has to be nailed down. Our salvation is a gift of God. Get it now. It was planned by God the Father. It was implemented by God the Son. But it's applied to us by the Holy Ghost. The, the Holy Spirit of God. So it, it's, it's all of God when we exercise our faith. Now, let's go a little bit further. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Let me talk to you about the word workmanship for just a moment. The Greek word is poema, P O. Uh, E-I-M-A, I believe is the way it's spelled. But it's poema, and it's the word we get our word poem from. But the, the literal translation of workmanship is a masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. When you got saved, God said, I'm putting you on the canvas, and now I'm going to paint and develop a masterpiece. We are the raw materials, but God's grace begins to paint in the hues and, and begins to put the right colors into our life, begins to fill us with his wonderful praise, his wonderful truth, okay? So we're his workmanship. Now notice the next phrase. We are created in Christ Jesus. The author, <laughs> the author is Jesus. And Paul says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Can I just tell you something? God has decided to paint a masterpiece, and it's you. It's you. You, 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 you are God's masterpiece. And he is going to finish the painting. He is not satisfied with just starting a painting and leaving it. God is going to work in your life. Oh, that's good preaching. God is not going to quit on you. Don't you quit on God. He's not going to quit on you. You. God said, you're my masterpiece. And I have a design in mind. And some of us have messed the design up. But you know what? He didn't throw the masterpiece away. He said, I can still take something and put the right colors in. I can change that. I can cover up that mess that was there. I know some people who got some tattoos. They wish they would never got them. But later in life, they got their life straightened out with God. And they said, i got to cover that mess up. And they went back to a tattoo artist. He said, I won't take the old one out, but I'm going to cover it up. I got covered by the blood of Jesus October of 1966 and all of that mess got covered over oh hallelujah you are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus now notice this for good works which God oh, God prepared beforehand before you ever got saved God said I got a plan for your life if you'll cooperate with me I'll plug you in and the things I've got planned will be more fulfilling than you could ever find on your own I have prepared them before the foundation of the world so you can walk in them in 19 started for me in and whatever year it was I got saved <laughs> October of 1966, I got plugged in. And he has a plan that hasn't stopped in 2023. It's been prepared beforehand. Now, I can cooperate with grace. Or Galatians 2 says I can frustrate the grace of God. I don't want to mess up my painting. 
I want the masterpiece that God designed for me. Now, so how do we, if, if we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, how do we recognize that? How do we, how do we, how does that balance with works, with good works? Well, that's what I'm going to tell you today. That's what we're going to talk about. He says in chapter 5, verse 17, if anyone, are you an anyone? Talk to me. Yeah, you're an anyone. You are that masterpiece. And if you put it, get on the canvas, if anyone will get into Christ, he becomes a new creation. And old things, old things, got any old things? They can pass away. They can be passed away and all things become new. You may have messed up yesterday, but your yesterday doesn't have to control your today or your tomorrow. God has a brand new today and a wonderful tomorrow if you'll step into it. And you step into it because of the grace of God. It's amazing. It's amazing. But the works that come out of the life that surrender to God are just as amazing. Now, I, I, oftentimes I'll say something very simple and kind of have developed a reputation of being a simple preacher. That's all right with me. Uh, but I make some simple statements and I do it on purpose because I want it to grab you. And, I, and I, I put this together. Good works are good. It's good to do good works. The reason we call them good works is because they're good. Now I want you to say it with me. Good works are good. It's good to do good works. The reason we call them good works is because they're good. That's good. Amen? That's good. That's good. Masterpieces are good works. And you are God's masterpiece. It's good to do good works. Because good works are good. Ha, amen. Now, question I want to ask you. So since good works are good, are we saved by good works? No, no. Okay, we got that. We, we're all clear on that, right? We're not saved by good works. We're saved by what? Grace. Grace through faith. faith. All right? Now, are, are, are we judged by grace or by works. Now, don't answer me yet because you get it wrong if you do. Are we judged by grace or are we judged by works? It's like when you say, let me just say, are you judged by grace or by good works? Yes. <laughs> it's like when you ask when you're asked, do you want french fries and pie with that? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, are we saved by grace or works? Now, for salvation, we already clarified, we're judged by grace and not by works, right? Now, I'm going to show you in the scriptures, your works are still going to be judged, both believers and unbelievers. I'm going to talk to the believers today. You're going to face a judgment just like I will. So whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, the answer is yes, your works are going to be judged. Let me show you some scripture. We'll, uh, we'll get to 1 Corinthians 3 after a while, but let me show you some other scripture first. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14 says, For God will bring every work. Would you mind saying the word every? Every. Every. Every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Revelation 20, verse 13. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades. Hades is a Greek word for hell. Delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one. Would you mind saying the word each? Each one according to his works. Now, this is talking about lost people, these scriptures. But the next one's talking about saved people. Look at it. 1 Peter 1, 17. And if you call on the Father. Hang on just a minute. Let's take a poll. How many of you call on the Father? Now, see your hands? Yeah. 
All of us do that. Okay, so this verse is talking to you. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each, could you say each again? Each, each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear or reverence or awe. I like the way it says that, conduct yourself throughout your stay here. It's like he's saying to us, you're just visiting, and we are. Our stay is pretty brief here. Okay, Matthew 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each. Could you say each again? Each according to what? His works, okay? Can I ask you a question? Are you an each? Are you an everyone? Six verses we read. Six verses. And all six of those verses says that every each and every one will give an accounting to God. And the way he will do the accounting is looking at how we've lived our life. Our works are judged. So we understand that. But how do we understand grace and works? How do you put that together? Let me give you two other words. And these are words that you need to grab hold of. We must distinguish between the word belief and behavior. Now let me tell you the difference. Our belief determines where you spend eternity. Your behavior will determine how you spend your eternity. Now don't miss that. Our belief determines where we spend our eternity. You go to heaven because you believe in Jesus. You go to hell because you don't believe in Jesus. Our belief determines where we will spend eternity. But notice our behavior. Our behavior determines how many rewards the degrees of responsibility, the treasure that you're going to have in heaven, you need to send some on ahead because Jesus said, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. He didn't say lay it up for the Father and for me because we need some more gold to pave the streets with. No, he says lay it up, lay up treasure for yourself in heaven. Uh, make the message translation says stockpile some treasure in heaven. So evidently, we're going to do some business in heaven. Now, I, I'm going to shock you here a little bit, I think. Some people have the idea that when you get to heaven, you just everything's going to be all done and you're just going to float around on spoofle dust and, and lay back on the clouds and suck on grapes for eternity. No, that's not what's going to happen in heaven. Listen to me. In the book of Revelation, in the last, I think it's the last chapter of Revelation, it says that we will enter into heaven at the degree of where we left earth. So you're not all of a sudden going to be made a mature saint in heaven. You need to be maturing now because when trans transformation happens and you go home to heaven, you're still going to need to grow and walk with God. I want a head start. I don't want to just squeak by and get into heaven and say, Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that. I want to know more when I get there. But you're going to be growing throughout heaven. There are going to be some Bible teachers in heaven. I want to be one of them. There are going to be some preachers there. I want to preach in heaven. I, the, I'm practicing now getting ready for heaven. And when you get there, you're not going to have the encumbrances that get in the way. You'll remember all four points I preached last week just like that. You won't have to dig in your notes to find them. They'll be in your brain. They'll be inside of you. You won't have the encumbrances, but you're going to need to grow. Please don't miss that. Heaven's not going to be boring. I read somewhere the other day, a guy said, I just don't want to know whether I want to go to heaven or not. He said, it's just going to be boring floating around up there. I said, man, to myself when I saw that, you have no concept of what, Bible what the Bible teaches. Heaven's a wonderful place, and I want to go there, but I'm going to be learning forever. And forever. You say, I don't like to learn. You won't like heaven then. 
But listen to me, when the Holy Spirit teaches you something here, it does something down inside of you. Turns a tiger loose in your soul. When he puts a stroke on that master canvas and says, this hue needs to go in at this time. And whoo, there's something good about that. Something wonderful about that. So our belief determines where we spend eternity. Do you know where? The scripture says, Philippian jailer, Paul said, when he asked, uh, how do I get saved? He said, one thing you got to do, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy household. So it didn't just stop with him. See, that's the good thing about salvation. When men will become men and take a stand for God and say, I'm going to walk with God, their family starts walking along behind them. And that man's family, his wife and kids, the scripture says he even fixed a meal for Paul and Silas in the middle of that, 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 that transformed jail that happened. I have an idea, Ernie, they had some fried chicken, some red-eye gravy, might have even had some country ham that put in there in the process. Ah, oh, listen, it would have been wonderful, wonderful to have been a part of that meal. There was a party thrown when Gerald got saved too. Amen. But it didn't just happen here on this earth. There were angels that were rejoiced in heaven. Woo! Good, good, good. This is good preaching. In case you don't know, I just fill you in here today. This is good stuff. Belief determines where you spend eternity. I know where I'm going. Do you? If you don't, you can fix that today. Amen. Hallelujah. But not after, not after you believe, it doesn't stop there. Your behavior determines how you spend your eternity. Okay. Now, let's go on. There are two judgments. And a lot of people don't understand this. But there are two judgments. There's the judgment seat of Christ. And there's the great white throne judgment. I'm talking to you today primarily about the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is a judgment for believers. For believers. Now get that, get that down in your soul. Uh, unsaved people will not be at the judgment seat of Christ. But the good news is saved people won't be at the great white throne judgment either. That takes place about a thousand years after the judgment seat of Christ. Does. Well, that's next week, so don't want to get there. But just want to help you to see that. The great white throne, there are two judgments. One is a judgment for believers, and one is a judgment for unbelievers. So if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you had faith that is faith fixed on Christ, you'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, Judge Judy won't be the one sitting on the bench. Jesus is going to be the one who sits on the bench. He knows the end from the beginning. Remember, he's the Alpha and the Omega. And so he knows. He, I, I don't know how this is going to work. Mark, maybe you could help us with this. I don't know how this is going to work. But the, the, there, there is a, a, a recording that's happening in all of our lives. It, it is far beyond anything that we've developed technologically at this point. But God will bring back, if he needs to have a record, oh, in 1960, uh, 1966, October 31st, when you got to say, November the 5th, Gerald, here's what you didn't take care of like you should have. It'll go back that careful, that careful. Now, I won't be condemned for it, but I will be demoted in my rewards. Now, I'll explain that more as we go along, so don't look at me with strangeness this morning yet, okay? The judgment seat of Christ is a judgment for believers where our rewards will be given out and responsibilities will be given as well. You remember Jesus talked about a parable, he, a parable of the minus. And he said there was a landowner and he was going to be gone for a while. And so he had one guy he gave 10 minus to. To another, he gave five. Now, the, a minor is three months 
of wages. So if we brought that up to today, say you make five grand a month, that's 15,000 times 10. That's $150,000 that was handed to this guy. And Jesus said, now you take care of this because I'm going to come back again. I'm going to be looking for some interest. Well, time went by and the landowner came back and the one who'd been given 10 minus handed him 300000 back. The one who had been given five minus gave him 150000 back. So I'm kind of contextualizing that, bringing that up today. But you remember what Jesus said to the one who had 10 he said, you've done pretty good. Well done, good, faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Here, I want you to be ruler over 10 cities. So a reward is given. I don't know how all of that's going to look. I think it'll be better than being a mayor today. Uh, you're going to get more than six bucks and a lot of grief today if you're assigned to take care of 10, 10 cities in heaven. But that's a part of the responsibilities that's going to be happening at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the great white throne, there will be degrees of punishment. And we'll talk about that next week, so don't, don't go and get into that. The judgment seat of Christ. This is point one. I finally got to point one. <laughs> Whoa, goodness gracious, what time is it? It's already 10 after 12. Wow, got 20 minutes to go. Hey. <laughs> ah, the judgment seat of Christ. What's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ? Let me give you a couple of scriptures. First of all, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. For we must all, notice the word all, appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You're not going to say, I don't think I'm ready to get up and go to that judgment today. No, 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 no. You'll show up. All will appear, if you're a believer, at the judgment seat of Christ. That each one, there we're back to that word each again, that each one may receive the things done in his body. Since you got saved, you're going to give an accounting to God for what he has done, he says, whether it's good or bad. Now, that's not for salvation, that's for your behavior. He's looking at Romans 14, 10. But why do you judge, Paul says, your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So it's a judgment where every believer shows up at. Amen? Go ahead and give me the next one. Now, what happens at that judgment? Verse, here's finally got to... Chapter 3, I told you to find that early on. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. Now, I, I need to give you a little bit of background here so you understand this before I read the rest of the verse. 1 Corinthians is not the first letter Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. It's actually the second letter. Now, I know that sounds confusing, but Paul wrote a letter, and we know he wrote another letter prior to 1 Corinthians because he says in what we call 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the former treatise, former letter I wrote you, and he begins talking in chapter 7. He said, now concerning the things which you wrote to me. So they wrote back to him questions after he had sent them that first letter. So 1 Corinthians, what we call 1 Corinthians, is really the second letter. God said, Paul, I, I think God must have looked at the first letter and he said, Paul, that's not going to cut it. It's not going to get into the Bible. That, that You've got to redo that. And so he wrote chapter or wrote 1 Corinthians, what we call 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Now, as a result of that, one of the things that was going on in Corinth that they talked to Paul about in their letter back to him, there was a division that had started in the church. There were some folks who were saying, well, you know, uh, we went to the church and Apollos was a great orator and we loved to hear him preach. And, and, uh, and, and you know, I know, Paul, you were there, but you're more of a, a preacher teacher. You're not a preacher like Apollos was. And so we follow Apollos. We're not following, we believe, we're different than you. And Paul says, now, wait a minute. It's all right to have differences, but if you have divisions over those differences, you're carnal and walk as men who are still like people in the world. So he said, don't have 
Now, our churches today need to know that. We need to understand. If we are dividing over this little deal and this little deal, I'm not talking about doctrinal issues, but I'm talking about how long you cut your hair, whether you put your hair up, whether you let your hair loose, whether you wear a tie, whether you don't wear If you're dividing over that, you're carnal. I don't know how to say that. You're carnal. And you're still walking like, even though you say, I believe, you're still walking like somebody who's never known the Lord. So get it right. Straighten it up. Don't let things that are not important become issues that divide you and divide the body of Christ. So that's the context of what's happened. So now Paul writes and he says, according to the grace of God which was given to me, I, as a, a wise master builder, I laid the foundation and another builds on it. Now, you may think, well, the, another he's talking about would have been Apollos. No, Apollos was laying foundations too. Peter was laying foundations. When he says another build, that's you, that's me. We're building on that foundation that was laid it, which is, he tells us, is Jesus Christ. Go ahead and give me the next verse. Now, according to the grace of God, he says, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid the foundation, another builds on it, but get this, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, Jesus Christ. Now, he says, if anyone builds on the foundation, here's the building materials. Some build with gold, silver, precious stones, and some build with wood, hay, and stubble. Now, I need to call your attention to wood, hay, and stubble because there's a fire coming, and the fire is going to burn up wood, hay, and stubble. The difference is what, what you do for Christ is it eternal, or is it temporal? If it's temporal, the fire is going to take care of it and it'll be gone. But if it's precious stuff, eternal stuff, now let me help you understand what the difference in the two. There's a passage of scripture that uh, to me, I think some people miss. But let me read the rest of this. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. So there's a day coming. That's the judgment seat of Christ that will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Fire speaks of judgment. It's going to come. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort. Don't miss that word. Of what sort. What was the sort? Was it eternal? Was it temporal? If anyone's work, which he builds on it, the foundation of Christ, anyone builds on it, if the work endures, he will receive a reward. But I want you to notice grace. If anyone's work is burned, now remember all these are believers that are here. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. You talk about grace, yet so as fire. Now, let me help you a little more. Matthew 6 1 is a passage where Jesus gave that ties in with this thing of reward. And I don't think a lot of people have never, never tie these together, but, but we need to. Jesus said, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds. That would be good works before men. Get it? Here's the key to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do charitable deeds, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do and say, look at my tithes, look at this, look at this. I'm building, I'm building. A... Don't do that, he says. Don't go out in the streets and the synagogues so you get glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. And if you have your reward, if you're doing it to get reward from men, you won't get a reward from the Father in eternity. All that you invested yourself in, the fire will just sweep it away. But now listen, people may see your good works and they can still glorify God. And that's all right. If you're doing it for eternity and not doing it to be seen of men, 
Sure, it's wonderful. God gets glory. God gets blessed through it. And another line in the masterpiece gets painted clearly on the canvas of your own life. So he says, when you do the deeds, don't sound a trumpet before others that they can see it. But when you do a charitable deed, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deeds may be in secret. And your father, <laughs> which sees in secret himself, rewards you openly. I won't never forget when I saw the word himself for the first time. You know, isn't it marvelous as you're reading through the scriptures and the Holy Ghost will just take a word and jump it up off of the page and put it in front of you. I remember when I was reading, just reading along, and I, I read through this, and your father, which sees in secret, himself will reward you openly. And I thought, the, the thought hit me, I'm going to meet the father personally. He himself Listen, it's not going to be like on the judgment seat of Christ, an old gray-headed guy going to stumble out and say, all y'all done good out there. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not going to be like that. There'll be two old guys in the back just like it is now. One of them going to say, what did he say? The other ones will say, well, I, I said you need a little more wood. No, that's not going to be what's going to happen. No, no. It says the Father himself will reward you openly. Let that sink in. The Father. You're going to meet him personally. How's that going to happen? He's going to meet all of us? I don't know. But it says the Father himself will reward you openly. Now, I want to tell you something. You want to have something to be rewarded for when that time comes. Right, Vernon? Yeah, Vernon nodding his head, the rest of you, I don't know where you are, but Vernon's with me this morning. <laughs> Let me give you the next verse. First John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, when he comes back, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. How could a believer that's waiting for the rapture, and the rapture happens, and they're caught up. How could a believer ever be ashamed? Pretty simple. They haven't done anything to get rewarded for. Listen, you need to do more than sit, soak, and sour on a seat in Oak Grove Church. You need to be working for Jesus. You need to be telling, listen, you need to be witnessing at work. You need to be telling people there's a hell. You need to be telling people the Holy Ghost can fill you. You need to tell them how. You need to help them get into the experience. You need to live it out. We, can, we show up here to get fed, but we're supposed to go out from here and scatter the word wherever we go. I don't want to be ashamed. Uh, listen, you say, well, it, it bothers me to talk in front of people. What are you going to do when you face Jesus? Dale Taylor sitting back here, one of my buddies. Dale embarrasses me sometimes when we're out witnessing. He'll talk to anybody about Jesus, whether they want to hear it or not. Now, he's kind. And he's written article after article after article and put it in the paper, paid for it himself for it to be there so that unsaved people would have an opportunity to see there's a better way of life. Dale told me this last week, he and I were talking, he said, sometimes people get so mad at me. He said, I had one woman that called me on the phone and he said, I could almost see her teeth gritted. He said, she talked to me and she said, I'm going to sue you. He said, what are you going to sue me for? For that article you wrote. He said, what about the article? Do you think you need to sue me? But she was so angry. But before they left, the woman said, can I meet you for lunch somewhere? <laughs> Woo! Becky told him, said, you better not go. <laughs> ah, listen. Give him love. Amen. Will you be ashamed? I guarantee you, 
he won't be ashamed because he's told people everywhere, Jesus can fix your life. He can fix your life. I don't want to be ashamed. Let me ask you, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? Daniel Webster wrote this statement, and I'm closing with this. Daniel Webster, who wrote the Webster's Dictionary, he said, the greatest thought that's ever entered my mind is that one day I'll have to stand before a holy God and give an account of my life. The greatest thought, all the words in the Webster's Dictionary, all the phrases, he said, no, those are not the greatest thoughts. The greatest thought is that one day I'll stand at the judgment bar of God. It's called the Bema judgment. I've seen one when I was in Israel. And I'll give an account to a holy God for my life. Holy Spirit, teach us, O oh God, in the recesses of our mind this truth today. Oh Lord, I don't know what you're saying to the individuals here, but I want to do my best while I have a chance. I have a tomorrow. And so I ask you to help me and help others to glorify you. Amen. One last illustration and I'm done. I didn't grow up serving the Lord. Didn't grow up knowing much about the Lord. And so I lived a pretty immoral life for a lot of years in my life. And I didn't have much of a purpose. I just kind of wanted to do enough to get by. And when I was in a freshman in high school, I was a farm boy, and so I took Future Farmers of America, FFA. Some of you, anybody, here, anybody else here, you know what I'm talking about, FFA. A few of you here that understand that. I was in FFA, and I goofed off all year. I mean, I really did. I, I just goofed off, flirted with girls, prayed pranks on guys, and, uh, and I was pretty good at some of those. Some of them pretty good, pretty good. Uh, but the last week of the year, we had a banquet. I had a big dinner. We were taught, told how we were supposed to dress. And uh, my teacher even told me, <laughs> told all of us country boys, he told us how the table would be set. And he said, now you start with this fork and you work your way in. You know, I mean, tried to give us a little bit of etiquette. It didn't go over real well with most of us. But anyway, we were exposed to it. I remember walking in to the banquet hall. And when I walked into the banquet hall where the dinner was, there were tables over here on this side, and they had trophies and ribbons all up and down. And I thought, nobody told me there were going to be awards at the end of the year, but there were awards. Now, I passed the class, but there were no awards with my name attached to them. And I want to tell you, I was embarrassed. But because of grace... I got to be a sophomore in FFA and I began to apply myself because I knew at the end of the year there'd be another banquet and there'd be some more trophies and I wanted my name on some of them. I need to tell you, there is going to be another banquet. There'll be the marriage supper of the Lamb and there'll be the judgment seat of Christ. And there'll be some trophies. I don't know how all that's going to work out. But I don't want to be ashamed and sit there and say I messed around all of my Christian life. I want my name called. Ernie, I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Do you?
Make up your mind today then. If you're not in the kingdom, get in. But if you're in the kingdom, let your behavior begin to reflect what you see in the mirror of God's word. Let him transform you. And let your works begin to glorify your Father, which is in heaven. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Be gracious to you. Don't forget what I've said today. Apply what you need to apply. Now, you can do that here around the altar. I'll be here after I close. I'll meet with you, talk with you, pray with you. But you may have a visitation from the Holy Spirit this week in your quiet time where he says to you, you need to make a little adjustments here. You need to cut this out of your life. You need to change this. Please, please hear me. Don't blow it off because there's a banquet coming that you don't want to miss. Now may the Lord bless you, keep you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. You're dismissed. Amen.